right, I'm going to walk to the back wall because it's been a few weeks since we've been here on this topic. Um, and so the book of Ruth uh, deals with a story where there are initially four main characters. Here they are. You have Elimelech. He is married to Naomi. Elimelech's, Elimelech's name means my God is king. Naomi's name means pleasant or delightful. They have two sons, Malon, whose name is sick or weak. Kilion's name means tired or dying. So not the most impressive names, but those are the boys. Uh, and there's a famine in the land, and the, the story takes place initially in Bethlehem, located about five miles uh, or so south of Jerusalem. And because of the famine that is in the land, they decide to leave Bethlehem as a family, and they go to the other side of the Dead Sea in the land of Moab. Uh, and today it would be the country of Jordan, but this is where they've settled. Now, the Moabites are very pagan people. They don't worship uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The Moabites are descendants of an incestuous relationship between Lot and one of his daughters who got him drunk one night and slept with them. So the Moabites are descendants of incest, and, uh, but while there, this family, the two boys uh, get married, and they marry a couple of uh, Moabite women. Uh, Kilion marries Orpah, her name means gazelle, and Melon marries Ruth, and her name means friendship. But while they are there in Moab to escape the famine back in their homeland, you know, the irony is they've left Bethlehem, which translates the house of bread, to go to Moab because there's no bread in the house of bread. But while they're in Moab, uh, things must get worse for them because the men die in the family. All the men die. So Elimelech dies and uh, sick and tired die. Uh, they live up to their name and they're gone. So it leaves uh, just the women, Naomi and her two daughters-in-law. And Naomi says to her daughters-in-law, I'm going to go back home. It's been 10 years now, but you ladies are from Moab, so you should stay here. And uh, Orpah says, okay, that sounds good to me. I'm going to start a huge uh, media conglomerate and have a talk show. No, that's, that's Oprah, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is Orpah, and, uh, and so she stays in Moab, but Ruth says, no, I'm going to go with you. And where you go, I will go, and your God will be my God. And so the rest of the story is about these two women, Naomi and Ruth, and they end up then going back to Bethlehem. And again, it's been 10 years, so Ruth has never been there, uh, but uh, Naomi, when she goes back, she, because of her, her bitterness in life, she's lost her husband, she's lost her two sons, she says to the people who at first don't even recognize her, she says, you call me Mara, which means bitter in Hebrew, because my life is bitter. And, and God's going to take a bitter story and make it very sweet. And that's the wonderful thing about what God often does in our lives. Now, it isn't that every story ends up happily ever after. You know, some stories are that God uh, sees us through the difficulties, um, and God's ever-abiding present is there through the difficulties. And then there are other times that He uh, brings us out of the difficulties, and, and He takes what is bitter and, and makes it sweet. Sometimes, however, He just gives us the endurance during the bitter times. He's faithful either way, and God is good no matter what our circumstances. And so, what he's going to show in the course of this story here, we'll get through, Lord willing, just chapter 3 tonight, he's going to show a very redemptive love story. And it isn't just the redemptive love story between a man and a woman, although that's part of it, as we will see here, between Ruth and Boaz, but it is also a picture of a redemptive love story between God and mankind. And Jesus is reflected in every book of the Bible, including the Old Testament, and we will see Jesus revealed in this redemptive love story too. But uh, probably not until we get to uh, chapter 4, but for tonight we're here in chapter 3. Now I will tell you that this chapter, as we begin to read it, is a very painfully practical chapter. And the reason I say painfully is because some of you might um, be a little offended by the advice that Naomi gives her daughter-in-law. But I want you to know that the advice that she gives her daughter-in-law is not only practical for Ruth, it's practical for every single woman. So if you're here tonight as a single woman and you're going to read this with me, don't be insulted. Like, let some of this speak to you because this is straight out of God's word, even though it's very, very practical. You'll see as we go through it. So here, chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall I not seek security for you, that it may be well with you? 
Now, Boaz, whose young women you were with, is he not our relative? In fact, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. So um, this tells us basically the time of year because you would uh, harvest barley in the months of April. It was usually one of the first um, crops to be harvested even before the wheat harvest. So this, is, this story takes place around the month of April. We've previously been introduced to Boaz in chapter two. His name means strength. Uh, he is a very successful man we find out. He is very wealthy. He has a, a great uh, agricultural business. He has a lot of employees. And um, one of the things that, that he does is he takes an interest in Ruth. He sees Ruth, who is gathering some of the leftover scraps from the harvest field to take home, which the Levitical law provided for. God made provision for those who were poor. And, and uh, God's law required that owners of fields, after it was harvested, don't pick up every scrap. The parts that lie on the ground, the poor are able to come freely and gather. This is what Ruth is doing one day, and Boaz notices her. And he even warns his fellow employees. He gathers all the guys together. He says, guys, don't you be making any advances towards that young lady. And he warns them. He basically challenges them because he's, he becomes very protective of Ruth. You can begin to see his heart is turning towards her. And so he warns all the other guys. He's like, don't you dare touch her, okay? And if you do... I own all these fields, they will never find your body. You know, that's the kind of thing that, he doesn't actually say that, but that's why I, I hear that in my head, okay. <laughs> now, Naomi, concerned for Ruth and sees kind of this little love scenario happening here, she's like, okay, like, like I, I want security for you. I want you, to, I want you to be able to get married and, and, uh, and have security here. And so, here's her advice. Verse three, therefore, Wash yourself and anoint yourself. Put on your best garment. Okay, pause right there in the middle of the verse because here's, here's where all this practical advice from Naomi to Ruth comes. And you can take it or leave it if you want, single ladies. But uh, all the single ladies sing it. You know, listen, I won't sing the song. But here, number one, <laughs> this is what she says. Look and smell your best. That's the first advice that she gives Ruth here. She says, look and smell your best. Now, um, people didn't shower every day like we do now. You know, everybody typically get, you know, takes a shower every day. And, uh, and they, didn't, they didn't live like that. They didn't have the luxury of that kind of thing. Even a few hundred years ago, people would only take baths once a year. Did you know this? In the 1500s, um, yeah, don't be startled. I'm actually going to tell you where certain phrases have come from, okay? Back in the 1500s, people generally took baths once a year, and it was in the month of May. And in this order, okay, the men of the house had the privilege of getting the first clean bath, then the sons, then the other men, followed by the women, then the children, and last of all, the babies. So by then, the water was so dirty that you could lose someone in the bath. And I'm not making this up. That's where the expression came from. Don't throw the baby out with the bath water. Did you ever wonder where that expression came from? That's where it came from. You as a family would take a bath once a year. By the time the babies would bathe, it would be so muddy. Don't throw the baby out with the bath water. Here's another little information, tidbit of information you may not know, that also it was traditional that weddings happened in June. Why? Because you took your bath in May. <laughs> but by June, you know, you're starting to smell a little, you know, after a month, you still aren't as, as sweet smelling as you were in May. Thus the tradition of a bride and her bridesmaids carrying bouquets of flowers. Okay, you get free information here at Cornerstone Chapel. You didn't know. Now you know. Why do we have bouquets of flowers? Because by June, you're starting to stink a little. Where did that expression, baby in the bathwater, come from? Now you know. So, Naomi says to Ruth, because they don't take showers every day, why don't you take a bath? Like, you know, clean yourself up. Now, 
Ruth was a virtuous woman. So she wasn't trying to turn heads, you know, or dress to impress. The fact that she is having to be coached here a little bit indicates that, you know, she's not all that concerned about her physical appearance per se. Her noble character is going to attract a man of noble character, because we find that in this story. Both Ruth and Boaz are people of noble character. You will attract the kind of, of person that you are. You will attract the kind of person that you are. It's amazing to me how many singles go bar hopping and clubbing looking for um, men or women who don't normally uh, bar hop or club. <laughs> and then you're surprised as to why the people you find there are so shallow. Well, stop going there. If you're easy, you'll attract easy. If you're virtuous, you will attract virtuous. Having said that, there's nothing wrong with anybody, but in the context of this story, there's nothing wrong with a woman looking her best, especially if you want someone to notice you. And so Naomi basically says to Ruth, take a bath, soak in some bath salts, go get your nails done, and then go on over to Ulta, slap down a few Ben Franklins, and <laughs> get some makeup and some Moabite Delight perfume. And doll yourself up. Now, remember, Ruth, Ruth, Ruth has been working in the fields, so she's a little grungy at this point. And Naomi's just telling her to clean up a little bit. If, if, if you want Boaz to notice, clean up a little bit. Now, at this point, some of you might be saying, well, wait a minute, I know a Bible verse. It's 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 4. <laughs> and it says it is more important to have inward beauty, inward beauty, inward beauty. <laughs> than to adorn the outward appearance. So what about that verse, Pastor Gary? Okay, fine, that, that, be very spiritual, that's wonderful. Have your inner beauty, that is terrific. But I just am telling you, guys are very visual, and so they're very visual, and long before they're gonna notice your inner beauty, they're gonna see your outer looks. <laughs> and so there's nothing wrong. You say, well, that's so shallow. Well, there's, there's nothing shallow about wanting to look good, and there's nothing shallow about at least immediately being attracted to an outward appearance. So this is the advice that Naomi's giving her. Now you know why I'm saying this is painfully practical. Now some of you are already offended, like this sounds, this whole Bible study is shallow so far. Well, <laughs> fine. I mean, if you want the freedom to have hair like a wolf and smell like a fish tank, fine. I mean, you... You can be that way. I'm just telling you, in practical terms, if you want a guy to notice, take a bath, look good. That's what Naomi's saying here. Now, it, it still stays practical. There's three things that she says. Come on back, come on back, because look at the rest of the verse. So she says there, therefore, wash yourself and anoint yourself, put on your best garment. Look at the rest of verse uh, three, and go down to the threshing floor, I love this. But do not make yourself known to the man, to Boaz, until he has finished eating and drinking. How practical is that? Number two, a man is in a better mood and a full stomach. It's, it's true. It's just true. Look, let him eat. Naomi's basically saying, let him eat a few chicken wings and watch the game before you hit him with your list. It's in the Bible. It's right here. <laughs> if, if you tell him everything that's wrong in the house and with the kids, the moment he steps through the door, he isn't going to listen, let alone care. Like, feed him first. <laughs> I mean, we know the saying, right? The way to a man's heart is through his stomach. That's not just a, a phrase. That's truth. That's truth right in the Bible. <laughs> like, let him eat first. This is smart stuff that Naomi is saying here to Ruth. This is good advice. Naomi knows. Why does Naomi know? Because she was married. She was married. Look, listen, some of you single ladies are confused about men, and so you go to other single ladies to try to figure out men. Listen, how about going to a woman who has one? <laughs> Don't go to another single lady and ask them to translate men. How about finding a married woman who actually has one? And then she can translate men to you. And say, well, this, this, listen, this is how they are. This is how they work. This is kind of weird about them. And this is kind of, you know, the way they are. But, but, you know, this is Naomi expressing to her. And so Naomi's translating to Ruth. 
And she basically says, Truth, now when you go there, this is the first part of what I just read. He says, she says, now when you go there, be invisible. Like, like, do not make yourself known to the man, she says there in the verse, until he is finished eating and drinking. In other words, just don't walk up to Boaz and go, can you just explain to me, where are we in this relationship? You know, you never call me, you never text me, and, and I'm just kind of, I have to follow you on Instagram to even find what you're up to. Like, stop that. Like, that's called stalking. Like, I, he's not going to respond with joy when you start talking like that. And by the way, most men don't want an emotional dump truck unloaded on them either. Like, just relax. And so, Naomi goes, just go there, but don't even, don't even be noticed. Don't even be noticed. Just go there and wait until he is, has a full stomach and, and he's in good spirits. Then, then. Okay, now, verse 4 seems a little strange to us, I will admit. Verse 4, Naomi continues with her advice. She says, Then it shall be, when he lies down, that you shall notice the place where he lies, and you shall go in, uncover his feet, and lie down, and he will tell you what you should do. <laughs> now, this is not typical advice you would think to give to your single daughter. You know what I'm saying? Like, you're really interested in a guy? Okay, go find out where he lives, stalk him at his apartment, and then climb up the balcony like a ninja, sneak in where he is, lie down by his feet, uncover the blanket. Nobody would give their daughter typically this kind of advice. But some things in the Bible are descriptive, not prescriptive. All right? It's just not like, here's, here's how it should always work. This is something unique here to the culture. It was very common in the culture that when you would lie down at someone's feet, you were, uh, you were showing your humility and submission. Ruth is going to show here her humility in, in this act of what, of what she's doing here. And um, the third point that, that uh, Naomi makes here out of verse 4 is, is that it's okay to let a man know that you are interested and available. Now, you say, but I don't want to chase a guy. Okay, true, you, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't be chasing after a guy, but it's okay to get in his way. <laughs> it's okay to get in front of him once in a while. You know, sometimes guy, guys are a little slow, and sometimes guys are a little intimidated, and some guy, sometimes guys lack confidence, and giving a guy a little indication that you are interested too and that you're available is, is all that he needs. And so, and so Naomi is saying to Ruth, give Boaz some incentive here to make a move. And, and so this is the advice that she is, is giving her. Listen, single ladies, sometimes a man doesn't pursue you, not because he's not interested, but because he thinks you're not. So a, just a little indication will, that, that you're open uh, to some kind of a relationship goes a long way to help a guy who's otherwise slow or intimidated or lacks some confidence uh, to, to make a move. Now, Ruth, in, in the story here, let's go back to the text. So, so verse, verse 4, this is uh, the last of the advice that she, that she gives her here. And so in verse 5, so Ruth says, uh, and she said to her, uh, all that you say to me, uh, I will do. And so, verse 6, so she went down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law instructed her. And after Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was cheerful, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. And she came softly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. Now, I, I want to emphasize here, this is not something sub, uh, suggestive. She's not being provocative. Right, there, there's a big difference between being provocative in an effort to turn heads and simply being attractive inside and out with dignity. There's, those are two very different things. This is not her attempt to seduce him. This is uh, something very cultural in terms of just showing her um, willingness and humility that if he's interested, she's wanting him to know I'm interested. 
And what happens if uh, not just a man, but anybody is typically asleep and you uncover their feet? What typically happens? Their feet gets cold and they wake up. They're kind of startled by like, who uncovered my feet? Like eventually it wakes you up. And this is what happens here. She's wanting to get his attention here. And so it says in, in verse eight, and so it happened at midnight that the man was startled and turned himself, and there a woman was lying at his feet, and he said, who are you? Okay, you have to remember, this is midnight, so it's dark, and he can't tell who this is, and last thing he knew, he just went to sleep, and all of a sudden he's woken up, his feet are uncovered, and there's some woman at the, at the end of, of uh, where he's lying. And so she answered, I am Ruth, your maidservant. Take your maidservant under your wing, for you are a close relative. Now, some translations where she says, take your maidservant under your wing, some translations uh, read, spread the corner of your garment over your maidservant. Um, this is a statement she is making here to uh, basically invite what we would call, even still today, his spiritual covering. Like even as a garment is thrown over someone and covers them physically, she's asking for him if he's willing. She's, she's not being forward here. This is still culturally, she's being gracious to him, but she's letting him know, I'm interested if you're interested. What she's asking here is for his covering. Now, th that's a term that is used even today. And, um, it, and, it's, and the idea behind that term is that husbands should provide some type of spiritual covering for their wives in the sense of protecting her, loving her, uh, making sure she's taken care of, uh, being willing to, to die for her if necessary, like, like having a loving leadership uh, for his wife such that there is this, in a spiritual sense, a covering. And uh, some of you ladies who might be married to an, a non-believing husband know exactly what I'm talking about because it's not there for you that, and you long for it. I wish, I wish for a spiritual leader who would give loving leadership and, and a sense of a covering and protection for me. I mean, he might be there for you, you know, physically to protect, but there's something to be said about a spiritual covering where a man will intercede for his wife. He will pray for her. He, he you know, look, you know, when you go back to the garden and you see what happened there between uh, Adam and Eve and Satan, the serpent, you know, it, it requires men. Men should be motivated to pray for their wives, to guard their hearts and their minds in Christ Jesus. So, you know, it's an important role. This isn't some kind of a domineering role when we talk about a covering. It is just a loving, leading role to protect a wife, both physically and spiritually in prayer and, and every other way. So this is what she's insinuating here. She's like, whatever the translation, however it goes, throw, throw your garment over me. Or she says, um, uh, take your maidservant under your wing. That's, that's what she's asking. Will you be my covering? And she says there, verse 9, for you are a close relative. Now, we talked about this uh, word last time because it first appears in chapter 2, verse 20. But here it is again. The word close relative can also be translated kinsman redeemer. The Hebrew word is goel. And it is found 23 times in Ruth. That's more times proportionally than any other book of the Bible. So it's an important term. And the goel was the nearest living blood male relative. Now again, under the Levitical law, God provided for widows that if their husband died, that they were not to be left destitute. And particularly in this culture, you have to imagine that a woman's survival was really dependent upon a man providing for her. And so when she became a widow, I mean, she was destitute typically. And so God provided for a widow by saying that the man's nearest relative, the deceased male's nearest blood relative had an obligation to marry the widow. 
if, if, if he was unmarried, to take her and uh, to provide for her, protect her. And there were different obligations that the kinsman the redeemer had. And I'll go into it in a moment, but let me just read a little bit further. And so she says to, to Boaz, you, you are a goel. You are a kinsman redeemer. You are a close relative. So it only makes Levitical sense for you to marry me if you're willing. And now we find out he actually is willing. Look at what he says in response, verse 10. Then he said, blessed are you of the Lord, my daughter, for you have shown more kindness at the end than at the beginning in that you did not go after young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you request. For all the people of my town know that you are a virtuous woman. Isn't that, isn't that a great statement he makes there? He says, your reputation in my whole town is that you are a virtuous woman. Oh, wouldn't it be wonderful if the reputation we had in our town was that people saw our virtue. And so he commends her for this. He says, but everybody in town knows that you are a virtuous woman. And he says in verse 12, now it is true that I am a close relative, however, there is a relative closer than I. Stay this night, and in the morning it shall be that if he will perform the duty of a close relative for you, good. Let him do it. But if he does not want to perform the duty for you, then I will perform the duty for you as the Lord lives. Lie down until morning. Now, again, they're both virtuous people. There's nothing sexual going on here. He just says, lie down. It's the middle of the night. It's midnight, we found out. So he's not going to send her out in the dark. He hears her heart, and he responds in like kind. He basically lets her know, I'm interested too. But he says, the fact of the matter is, I'm not the closest relative. Now, in the Levitical law, here was the order. If a woman's husband died, the next blood relative male who would marry her would be the deceased man's brother. If he was not willing or dead, it was the deceased man's uncle. If he was not willing or dead, it was the uncle's son, meaning the cousin of the deceased man. And if he was not willing or deceased, then it was any other close blood relative. So we don't know where Boaz fits in that list. We do know from the next chapter that Ruth's husband of the two brothers was Malon. And so Boaz is related to Malon but he's not the closest relative. So he's obviously not the brother because the only other brother, Kilion, died. And it means that he's not, the next relative in the list would be an uncle. So he's not the uncle because he says, I'm not the closest relative. So he could be the uncle's son, he could be a cousin, or he could be someone after that down the line. But, he, but listen, look what it indicates. He goes, I, I've, I've already done the calculation. I already know where I am down the list. So he, he's just as interested in her, but you know, they're not forward people here. They're not, you know, they're not aggressively trying to, you know, pursue each other. They're just kind of waiting on the Lord. And, and that's the best way for a relationship to develop. You wait on the Lord, you stay pure, you stay virtuous and, um, Nothing wrong with wanting to be physically attractive to each other or being physically attracted. I've had Christians come to me saying, you know, I feel like it's so carnal or unspiritual that I'm physically attracted to her. I'm like, what? You got to live with her the rest of your life. She's got to live with you the rest of your life. You better like what you're looking at. That is not being like unspiritual. That's just being like normal the way God has, has wired us. You should be attracted to someone. So that's not like carnal or unspiritual. But, um, but, what, but what they're attracted to here about each other is, is not just a physical attraction. There's virtue that they see in each other. There's a relationship with the Lord that is developed. And, and Ruth, Ruth, Ruth is a Moabite. Like, this is all new to her. Naomi, as her Jewish mother-in-law, has been obviously helping her to understand Jewish law, a relationship with God. Ruth has already expressed her desire to not only be with Naomi, but to worship the God that Naomi worships. So she's become a proselyte to Judaism here, but she's new to all this. And, and Boaz has already calculated this. He goes, yeah, I'm interested too, but I'm not the closest relative. And he says, but I tell you what, he says, um, you know, I've noticed you haven't gone after all the other young rich men. Like you've, you've been waiting and he's taken note of that. And he says, if this closest relative does not want to marry you, I will. I will. But we got to go through the right channels first. We got to see if he's interested. So he says, you just lie back down and we'll, we'll take care of this tomorrow. 
Now, I want to share with you the obligations of the kinsman redeemer. There are four as, as the, the Bible prescribed it, and here they are. The first one was the kinsman redeemer was responsible to buy a fellow Israelite out of slavery. So if you were the nearest relative to someone who, and this is how they would often become slaves, when you owed a debt that was um, so great you couldn't pay it back, you actually uh, became an indentured servant to someone. Uh, and that was the way you tried to repay the debt. If your closest relative, however, could pay off your debt in order to secure your freedom, then that was the responsibility of the kinsman redeemer. So that was one. Number two, a kinsman redeemer also was responsible to be the avenger of blood, is what it says in the Bible, that phrase, to make sure the murderer of a family member answered to the crime. That's Numbers 35, 19. So here's the case. If someone uh, was murdered, the nearest relative of that murdered individual was to take up your cause for justice. That was the kinsman redeemer. The kinsman redeemer had that responsibility to make sure that the, the family member who was murdered is, uh, is going to get justice because you're going to pursue, you're going to be the avenger of blood. You're going to pursue the one who murdered your loved one. So that was also a role of the kinsman redeemer. Number three, the kinsman redeemer was also responsible to buy back family land that had been forfeited. That's Leviticus 25, 25. And kind of in a similar way, when people got themselves in debt, they would sometimes sell themselves into slavery. Likewise, when people got themselves into debt, they would have to forfeit land. Well, the kinsman redeemer in a family, if he had the means, whoever the nearest relative was, was to do the kind thing for their family member and buy back that land in order to secure it back in the family. Now, this is all, I'll summarize this in a moment, but that's an important point because this all has to do with family and, and keeping family um, in a place where they are um, uh, being protected and helped and provided for. And then number four, and this is the one that really applies to this story. Number four, the kinsman redeemer was responsible to carry on the family name by marrying a childless widow. That's Deuteronomy 25. And so that's, that's the case here. This is why Ruth is appealing to him. If you're interested, I'm interested. You are a close relative because I am interested, but I'm not the closest. So we got to figure that out first before we can, we can get married potentially. So to summarize it, here it is. The kinsman redeemer was responsible to safeguard the persons, the property, and the posterity of the family. The persons, the property, and the posterity of the family. That's what his role was. And in this particular case, he's related to Malon in, in some way by blood. And so he senses this obligation. But you can see here in his response, it's more than an obligation. He actually has a heart for her. He's been watching her. She's been gleaning in his fields and he's taken an interest in her. And so she has with him. And so he, he says to her, just lie here. We got to go investigate this. See if the other closest relative wants to marry you. If he doesn't, I will. And so it says in verse 11 and so, or verse 14 rather, and so she laid his feet until morning and she arose before one could recognize another. In other words, it was really early in the morning. And then he said, do not let it be known that the woman came to the threshing floor because he, he doesn't want uh, this. It looks bad. Like, oh, they just spent the night together. He's like, no, you know, so she leaves early in the morning. He doesn't want her to get some kind of uh, bad reputation uh, about something that didn't happen. And so verse 15, also he said, bring the shawl that is on you and hold it. And when she held it, he measured six ephahs of barley and laid it on her. And then she went into the city. So he, you know, he's again, he's taking care of her. He's providing for her. He knows that Naomi is also in a similar situation. And so he, he just, you know, take off your shawl. It becomes like, you know, a... Uh, like a, a, a garment to carry all these sheaves. And so he puts all this barley in, in this garment, in this, um, uh, the shawl, and, and she hauls it back home. And verse 16, and when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, is that you, my daughter? Naomi, again, she's her daughter-in-law, but it's affectionate. Is that you, my daughter? And then she told her all that the man had done for her. This is what happened. She gives her the whole lowdown. She, you know, they spend, you know, wee hours talking about this with a cup of coffee. And so verse 17, 
And she said, these six ephahs of barley he gave me, for he said to me, do not go empty-handed to your mother-in-law. Now, this is smart, right? He's already, he's already getting in with the mother-in-law because he already knows, like, I'm going to send a gift with you so that she'll like me. I'm sure that he's mo motivated by more pure things than that. But, uh, but, you know, a gift never hurts. A gift never hurts. Verse 18. And then she said, Sir, sit still, my daughter, until you know how the matter will turn out, for the man will not rest until he has concluded the matter this day. So Naomi just encourages her, like, all right, look, he's going to have to investigate who the nearest relative is. You just, you know, be patient. You know, don't worry about it. God's going to sort all this out. He's going to take care of it because Naomi knows that, that Boaz is a man of character too. He's a man of virtue. And if he said this, he's going to do it. So he's just... You know, you can imagine, like anybody would be in this situation. Ruth is probably like, you know, do you think he's going to follow through? Do you really think that he likes me? Do you really think he wants to marry me? And was this just a line that he gave me? Like, well, I'm not your closest relative, but we'll figure it out later. You know, and Naomi's like, no, 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 it's not a line. It's all good. This is a man of virtue. I think he really loves you. And God's going to sort all this out. So the rest of the story in chapter four. But for tonight, we're going to conclude with communion. So we'll park it there for tonight. Let's pray as the worship team comes and ushers as you prepare to distribute the elements. Lord, we, we thank you for this uh, story because um, Lord, as we, as we conclude it soon, we, we see your mighty hand working in this love story, more than a love story between a man and a woman. This is a love story between you and us. It's a picture of your redeeming love and how Lord, all of us, fall at your feet in humility and you have mercy on us and you care for us and you provide for us and you love us and you redeem us. And we thank you, Lord, as we prepare our hearts to receive communion, that this is a reminder to us of that very act, your redeeming love expressed on a cross. You died for the sins of the world so that we might be forgiven By the cross, you have redeemed us from a fallen, sinful world. You have saved us from ourselves. And we just pause even before we receive the elements to remember, Lord, how you tell us in your word that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you, Lord, that you are our kinsman redeemer. You were the one who came among us to die for us. You took on our sin and the punishment of our sin, that we might be forgiven, that we might be right with you. Thank you for that. Thank you for your forgiveness and your mercy and your grace. We stand in awe of your sacrifice for us, of your love for us. And as we draw near to your table tonight, Lord, we remember how your blood was shed and your body was broken on that cross. And we're grateful people. In Jesus' name.